You're listening to the Fashion Ambition Podcast, and I'm your host, Natalie Robin. The Fashion Ambition Podcast is all about bringing you the tools and strategies to start and scale your business or career in fashion through conversations with industry experts who have been there and done that. Whether you're a startup founder or a new fashion graduate, or you just know that a career in fashion is your calling, we have an episode to help you launch. Make sure to keep up with new episodes by following the podcast at The Fashion Ambition on Instagram, where I update you on new episodes every week. You can also find my blog on Instagram at Nomad and Mode and online at nomadandmode.net, where you can find fashion tips and travel guides from how to pack for a six month backpacking trip to the best places to shop in Paris. You can also find all of the links to the website and to connect with me and each of the guests in the show notes. So with that, let's get into the episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. So today I'm really excited to be joined by Tiffany Kwong to talk about pursuing a career in brand management. So Tiffany is someone that I've wanted to interview for a while now because I really admire her work in content creation, and she creates such beautiful photography through her brand and blog, The Picky Princess. Everything that she creates on that brand is so well thought through. It is such a production. So it was definitely something that I wanted to talk to her about. And just a little bit more about her background. She's a professional brand marketing and content creator with experience in print and digital publishing. Her work experience also includes luxury magazine editorials, the wedding industry, influencer marketing and education, where she's worked with brands like CoverGirl, McCormick, Belief and VDL. She also has held roles in marketing, content, sales, digital art and student services. So in addition to brand management, in this episode, we'll be covering strategies for content creation, as well as some really great career advice for new grads searching for their first job out of university. So with that, let's jump right into the episode. Just to get us started and to kind of introduce um, the listeners to you and what it is that you do, I'd love to hear a little bit about your own career trajectory and what's kind of brought you to where you are right now. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of my background, I actually, it's a kind of a funny story. I started school with my first year in like life sciences and I realized very quickly that it was just not creative enough for me. So I switched out and I eventually graduated with a media studies major, double minor economics and English. And everybody always tells me that's kind of like a weird thing, but I kind of realized that what it was kind of setting me up for was a creative field in marketing. A lot of media studies, it's all about like psychology and like why people buy what they buy versus like then you have the economics to kind of look at the business side. And then English is always great for copywriting as well. Mm -hmm. Eventually, uh, just to kind of like kind of move myself forward, I ended up in a fashion marketing diploma. And even though I did find that the uh, program itself, it's really good for those people who you're not really sure what you want to do in fashion. So it kind of introduces you to everything. So I knew very quickly, like, okay, I don't think I want to be a buyer. I don't think I want to do this, but I think I want to do editorial or I would want to go into like public relations. Mm -hmm. So very lucky for me, I ended up at an internship with Wedlux Magazine. And at this point, I'd already done like two years of an online internship with College Fashionista. And uh, back then it was all like editorials. Like now it's very different, but before they Mm -hmm. had like people all across North America, like all across different universities. And I was writing for them, but also editing a lot of their material. And I ended up at Wedlux as a social media and editorial intern. So that was really cool. I got to help like write the blog stories. I was like running their Cayman Bows Instagram account, building that out for them. And just when I thought like I'd have to like, you know, be done with it, like my internship was over, I ended up with them for a year as an art department assistant. So I did a lot of layouts. I did research for like trend reports. We did a beautiful global trend report that went out every season. Mm-hmm. And then we, I got to like work on photo shoots for them. And I even got the opportunity to be the assistant editor for Cayman Vows magazine, where which was super cool because that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of being able to say that I'm like published somewhere. Uh, Then I moved on to Influencer and I was a brand partnership manager. So there I was kind of looking at like selling these individual campaigns with them. So they do like a lot of boxes for like companies that want to either highlight a hero product or maybe they also want to like do a new product launch as well. So I got to work with like CoverGirl, OGX, uh, Juice Beauty brought on a lot of new uh, different publications for them as well doing editorial and stuff. 
Mm-hmm. And then I ended up where I am now. So I'm a assistant brand manager for a private university. But prior to that, I was their social media community specialist. I was their marketing coordinator. So just slowly making my way there. And I yeah. really love brand management because I get to like champion the brand message and the image and kind of like making sure that every campaign is being run smoothly. And I work very closely with the art department and the strategy department as well. hmm Okay. Wow. I didn't actually, like, I knew a little bit about your story, but I didn't actually know that you had um, studied economics as well. Like I knew, I knew the fashion (laughs) part and I knew like the media part, but I didn't know that you also tied that in with economics. So that's, yeah, that's really um, interesting to hear. And also such a great point that it kind of steered you into what it is that you're doing now. Um, But I wanted to ask you something about brand management because um, I think and especially because you kind of do that um, with your content creation, with the Picky Princess and your blog as well. I was wondering, like, if somebody is kind of struggling to curate their account, like say they're a blogger, a new blogger, for mm-hmm. example, or even a new brand, and they're struggling to kind of get that brand aesthetic down, what would be the first step to that, seeing as that's kind of your focus now? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question because I think a lot of people when they're first starting out, they're it's really hard when you're branding for yourself because like mm-hmm. you can't see past, okay, I think I want to do this or or I think I want to do that. But that's where like doing a lot of planning and asking yourselves the right questions to set you up for success are very important. Mm-hmm. So some of the questions that I always say there's about like three of them. So the first one is what is my product or service? So for myself, the Picky Princess, I'm a like a a brand reviewer, right? So like everything for the Picky Princess is like my brand message is, is um, you know, I'm going to give you an honest review and I'm going the pickiest person that you know. So I'll give right. you an honest review. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. Mm-hmm. But that's what your product or service is. So like, let's say um, even for like the fashion ambition, like your service is this podcast, but what you're trying to do is your service is you're trying to service people who right. aren't really sure what to do. So then the second one is who is my target audience? So really ask yourself like who's listening and who's watching. Mm-hmm. So my target audience, um, there are females 18 to 35 and they predominantly live in Asia and North America. They're mm-hmm. elegant, luxurious, and they're the girl that's going to like wear a ball gown to the grocery store just because she wants to. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of had to like start spinning that into because of that target audience, does that kind of decides what colors that you're going to be implementing and what font you're going to be implementing? Mm-hmm. So like a serif versus a sans serif, are you like going to be more minimalistic? Are you doing poppy bright colors? Like who is the person that you're trying to speak to? But that person also has to be yourself as well, because if you're just kind of like not authentically posting, then people are going to see through that as well. Yeah. And the third sure. one that it's not really like a question to ask yourself, but this is more like a tip. Uh, If you're not sure what to post is you can actually break it up a little bit. So do like a headshot to a body shot, to a product shot, to Mm -hmm. a nature shot. And when you start like kind of playing around with that, like your feed will just look a little bit better. I know there are like influencers who like only stick to like one tone, but there are also influencers who do a really good job at just doing like rainbow colors as well. So definitely asking yourself, like, what am I trying to say? And who am I trying to say it for is very important. Mm -hmm. Right. So getting that audience down and finding a way to kind of visually um, communicate who it is that you are and what it is that you do through the fonts that you choose and Mm -hmm. the different um, photos that you take. And yeah, just who it is that you are and what it is that you do is probably that foundational piece. Um, Is there anything that you would suggest brand founders ask themselves if like, they've done all that and they're still struggling to grow their account. Like their number is just, maybe they're they're stuck at 1500 followers or something. I definitely think it's ask yourself why you're doing what you're doing. So even for myself, I've been stuck at like 900, like 75 followers for like a year. And I'm like, this year's the year I'm going to hit 1k. And I remember when that kind of like, there was a while where I was obsessing over numbers and Mm -hmm. my, my partner, I'm lucky that he's very supportive and he like had to ask me, okay, what are you really doing though? What, what is the service you're doing and why did you do it? And I had started this blog because a lot of my friends would come to me and ask me about products. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to write it and you can just share this information with everybody. And Mm -hmm that's like really the main purpose. And if you're always like obsessing over that number and how to grow, like you're never actually going to grow because then you're like, 
there's no such thing as a one size fits all marketing campaign. Like yeah. I could like, you can like listen to all those influencers that have like 25,000 followers and their things are going to tell you like, be authentic, like, you know, post and, and do this and do that. And you're like, I'm doing all of that. Nothing, nothing is happening. Yeah. But the number one thing that you have to do is make sure that you're also like on top of the game. So when you're looking at things like Instagram, like they are going to reward you for using their platform, right? So like if you're, you really, really feel like you're not growing and like you're doing everything that everybody's doing, then, you know, try your own thing, but adapt to this. So right now reels, like the more that you post, like the more it's being seen because of the algorithm on the Mm -hmm. back end of Instagram. But what kind of started happening was reels took off and then all of a sudden Instagram introduced live rooms and then everybody saw a huge tank in their reels engagement and views because Instagram said, Oh, look at this new shiny thing I have. And I want you to use it. So Mm -hmm. that's also like another thing that like, if you're kind of struggling and you're still not really sure what to do, try doing different things like that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that you should like divulge your message too much. Like let's say you're just, or maybe like tailor down to it. So if you're trying a whole bunch of other things, maybe be like, okay, it's called AB testing and marketing. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you have like you're testing two different things against each other, but the conditions have to be the same. So let's say um, on every Saturday, you're going to try doing a different type of reel, but you're going to post at the exact same time every single day. And you're just going to slightly change the message a little bit and see if that works. And you can even launch them at the same time. So at the same time, 6 p.m. on a Saturday and see which reel performs better and see Mm -hmm. if it's the number of hashtags you're doing. So there, even though there's like a lot of strategy that you can do, you also still have to just be like happy with what you have. So if you're looking at like the numbers and they're not growing, like don't take it personally, like Mm -hmm. you will get there. That's what I believe. Yeah, for sure. And I think sometimes people like, well, like you were saying, like they get a little bit too caught up in the numbers. And sometimes that can just be a vanity metric. If you don't have any sort of business model behind it, like if you're grow, if you don't have a business model or you don't have like a revenue, revenue stream coming in, behind those numbers like what it, what are those numbers for right yeah and then exactly. yeah and then with what you were saying with ab testing do you find that a lot of the time like the um the pain point is that brands like their messaging isn't strong enough yeah i think um there's two so there's the one where it's like so we call it like the five second rule so like if you can't catch somebody in the first five seconds then like they'll click out of your ad so mm-hmm. if you don't catch somebody in the first five seconds you're not interesting enough to do it or maybe your brand message is not strong enough. So like, um, sometimes like, like when I look at, uh, influencer ads, like it infuriates me. Cause then I'll just be like, <laughs> it just, it just feels like not authentic. And I think like, that's what a lot of people are also craving. Right. So like in that first five seconds, if I see it, like there, I can literally tell you about this time where there were these five influencers I used to follow. And all of a sudden they were all posing with like a certain brand of yogurt. And all the captions were just like, oh, my busy day. Like, I love yogurt. Like, no, you don't <laughs> because all your friends are posting the exact same exact content. Same yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I know you're actually getting like really heavily getting paid for it. Mm-hmm. But there are some people who are able to actually like work that in very authentically without, sorry, that's my my little dog in the background. Oh, all good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like it's really hard to like work it in organically, but also Mm -hmm. authentically. So you don't have to like lie if you don't like the products, but you can still do it in a way that's like, Hey, I've just tried this new product. Let me know what you think. And like, these are my thoughts Mm -hmm. and you can do it in a way like you could do videos, like to, to kind of catch them in the first place too. Like maybe it's just like you pouring out a yogurt and then the brand comes in. So you're kind of like sneaking that message in there. Right. So there's, it's definitely twofold. Like, are you catching their attention and is your message authentic and is it strong enough? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point too. Cause you don't like, just because you're new to a product doesn't mean that you have to pretend that you've been using it for years. You can literally take oh, yeah. like <laughs> your audience on the journey with you and be like, I'm just try- like trying this out now. And yeah. Um, we'll see how it goes. We'll see if I like it. And then you guys can see if you like it as well. Um, so that kind of takes me to the, my next question. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, how do you approach creating content for your own blog? Cause I, I know that your content is always such a production. It's just so like, <laughs> so well thought out from beginning to end. It's like, it's, um, yeah, it's just so nice. So I was wondering like, it, Thanks. Uh, yeah. How you start from, how you, how you start from like the concept to actually executing all of your content? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually kind of a funny story because like literally 
as I'm rushing to this podcast interview you, I was like stripping off my makeup because I was doing a mermaid look just <laughs> earlier. And um, I find that like the way that I, I approach my content is kind of how I approach when I was doing like photo shoots. So when I was like in school, there was like a while between uh, when I was working at Wedlux and after school, I was actually doing mm-hmm. like these lookbooks and people ask me the same kind of questions. Like, how do you approach this? And I don't just look at like trends, but I look at longevity. Like what do I think is going to look beautiful down the line? And I also think in layers. So I don't know if like how much Photoshop that you, that you use, but when you do Photoshop, mm-hmm to actually do a composition of an image, it's all in layers. So if you're not like able to think in like that three dimensional, it's actually like quite hard to when you're approaching content. So that's kind of how I look at it. I start with like, okay, what is the message or what is the cool thing I want to achieve and how can I achieve this? So for example, that mermaid thing I was just telling you about, Mm -hmm. I literally bought a mermaid tail and I did like my makeup. I know like, okay, you know, what kind of content can I come out of this? I can make a reel, I can make a video and I can do an image post. Right. So I kind of like plan all that out. I get all my colors to kind of like coordinate in the way that I think it's going to look beautiful. I mm-hmm. literally set up like a background for myself and I'm going to be Photoshopping myself out of this white background under the ocean. So you have to like really think about those layers. Yeah. And I think like when you're approaching that concept, it's like, I have a really clear message of, what I think the picky princess is like, I think she's like this person who she's very whimsical and mm-hmm. like, she's not afraid to be who she is. That's why like, I'm not afraid to be like, you know, I'm going to be in a mermaid tail today, or I'm yeah. going to be like walking down the street in a ball gown. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is like confidence, but really understanding who you are as a person. So like mm-hmm. one thing that I'm very proud of with my content is if one of my friends takes a look at my photos, even if it's not out of me, they're like, that's a Tiffany photo because of the way that I'll do composition. And I think it's also really understanding angles as well. So when I look into like content, um, I also kind of imagine if it wasn't me in the picture and I was photographing someone else, like how would I make that person look their most beautiful or like how to highlight like their best angles and their best features. Mm-hmm. And I definitely think like that's kind of the approach that I take when I go into content. I'm not sure if it a hundred percent answers your question, but it's a lot about like knowing who you are and like sticking to your guns mm-hmm. and thinking about it with a lot of depth and planning. Yeah. And something else I would like to add in terms of planning for the photo shoot. So back before pandemic, I was doing a lot of yearly lookbooks and the way that I would set that up because there's so many like moving parts I mean I am the photographer the model I am the makeup artist I'm uh, craft services as well so definitely when I'm planning for a photo shoot I make sure that my models have everything so I always give them like a modeling package I'll make this in design for them and send it out as a pdf just so that they can know and understand how the uh, photo shoot will be so I usually do an entire like schedule for them so like this is when you should arrive to do your makeup uh, this is when you should arrive after I've already inspected your outfits or by this day please send over your outfit um, I don't do a lot of pulling for styling just because it, that's really difficult to do for a bunch of people, especially if there's no advertising dollars behind those lookbooks. So a lot of the times I kind of encourage my friends to bring in new outfits or I'll share some of my clothes with them to kind of like top off their outfits or accessories. So before I even do that, when I'm conceptualizing like a new lookbook, I'll usually I do them by seasons and I kind of look at, okay, what's the next trend for the season? So one of the two favorite lookbooks I've ever done was probably Floral Rebels, which was uh, all leather and all flowers. And the second one was a 70s inspired one that I did for fall. So it was a lot of fall colors and lended really well into like burnt oranges and browns. And what I did was I created a mood board for everybody in Pinterest so that it was just a little bit easier for everybody to find that and they could go online and like look at different photos. And I would converse with all my models and make sure that we were all like kind of on the same page in terms of clothing. And I would usually also like bring in different inspirations for um, the makeup as well. So for Flow Rebels, everybody, all the girls, they had like a different like bright eyeliners. And then I put like flowers in their hair. Uh, They all have like fake flower bouquets in it. Uh, We even got some of my friends were like nice enough to like volunteer some of their time. So we got a beautiful cake by um, Addie Bakes. And I think now they're called Velvet Crumbs. But back then she actually made me a cake with like a leather jacket and some flowers on it just to kind of like really fit into theme. Um, In my modeling contract, I also make sure that the models know that I will be putting my... uh, my logo on these ones. That's just so that I know that when they're sharing and everything, that everything still looks good just because these are things that I'm conceptualizing myself. So I want to make sure that other people aren't just like stealing my photos or anything like that. I mean, sure. You can still like, um, 
edit out of a watermark, but I prefer if that was there for them. Uh, something else that I also do is I always make sure that we have kind of a um, drawings of how the posing will be as well. So if they don't have that, then we'll also do uh, like other pictures in Pinterest. So I might say, hey, I'm going to be doing a lot of like bottom up shots for this one. There's going to be a lot of glamour shots. Uh, whenever I do photography, I always make sure that I get everything, which is something I learned when I was at Wedlux. Uh, because when you go through all like these different photos that your brides will give you, you want to make sure that you have the glamour shot, the up close shots that you have, the full body shots that you have, the detail shots. Uh, detail shots are just as important as photos of just your models, just so that you make sure you have everything. And that will actually supplement your feed a little bit better. And it'll just look a little bit better when you're laying things out, whether doing that print or in digital as well. Yeah, no, I think that definitely does answer the question. And also, um, like with what you were saying about Photoshop and um, how, I guess, how important of a tool that is, um, that kind of brings me to my next question, which is like, if somebody is interested in brand management, what are like the essential tools? Say somebody's just coming out of school and they they know that this is kind of like the direction that they want to go, go into. What are some of the tools that they should build on, the skills that they should build on to kind of set themselves up for success in that? Yeah, definitely. If you're just coming out of school, especially like it is really hard to get into kind of like assistant brand managing or brand managing. So mm -hmm. I would also really even go back further. And if you are applying for university, try to get into a co-op program. Okay. Uh, a lot of those co-op programs will actually get you into like the door with like um, a lot of CPG companies that have a lot of those assistant brand managing positions. And usually mm -hmm. they'll actually hire those students afterwards full time. So that's like a really good way you kind of want to approach it. Um, I definitely think that like being a good brand manager is a mix of both design and analytical skills. So okay. if you cannot look at the data and understand it, then hopefully you have a team that's going to do that for you. Mm -hmm. But if you're starting out, it's like really important to like impress and be able to do that. So like looking at Google analytics, um, really trying to understand like social media analytics as well. So when you're looking on the back end, make sure that you understand what those numbers are. So mm -hmm. even if you're like not super, super in depth, like brand managers, they're not really going to have to, because there usually is like a strategy team, but you still have to know what you're looking at. Because if you're like confused, then like the, how's the team going to be able to look at you to like lead the brand? I think like design is definitely something you should know. Um, I think any any marketer actually should really know like Photoshop and InDesign at least. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I say that is because as a brand manager, it also, I think it's important for you to have compassion for the people who are on your teams. So right. what I've noticed too, is like a lot of people I know who kind of like are in brand managing, they kind of have this attitude where it's like, oh, well, graphic design, that's super easy. I want you to do it now, 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 now. Mm -hmm. But Something that I know my creative team really appreciates is because I know how to use Photoshop and InDesign, I'm a lot more compassionate in terms of timelines. So that's why they they prefer to work with me. If I come and I say, hey, like, I know this sounds like a little bit of a thing, but I think this is actually going to take you a little bit longer. Like, let's approach it in this way. Mm hmm and like they kind of appreciate that because they have someone who's like understands them on their side. And I think that's really important for brand managers. So I would also say like emotional intelligence is also really high up for brand managers because you have to like make tough calls a lot because at the end of the day, you're the person who kind of like leads the brand. Mm -hmm. But you also have to know when to make tough calls, but when also to be compassionate to others. So I think like it's kind of a trifold. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's um, like... Such a good point. I think people really appreciate when you know how much work um, mm -hmm. goes into what they do, because yeah, I think that is a struggle for a lot of creatives when when um, people don't understand the amount of time that actually goes into making you know a piece of art or um, yeah. even just like a booklet, a pamphlet, anything like that. You know, it's it, very time intensive. So much, and you also have to like kind of think about like the creative aspect too, right? Like if you give somebody like an hour to make something, it's not going to look good. Yeah. So how can you be <laughs> upset about that? But if you give them like a week, it'll probably look beautiful and the layout mm -hmm. will make sense. They'll choose the right colors, the right fonts. And you're like, that's amazing. It's like, yeah, because they had time to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of segueing from that, mm -hmm. are there any 
career tips that you would say, like not necessarily for brand managers only, but just in general, if somebody's entering the creative field or fashion industry, um, are there any career tips that you would give or that maybe you, you wish you had known when you were first applying, like for your first job? <laughs> yes, uh, definitely. I think one of the things, like, so there, there are a few, like, again, like I would go all the way back and be like, Tiffany, you should have won for a co-op program. Um, mm-hmm. I actually used to work for the University of Toronto. And I, actually, I still remember I had a first year student. It's so hard to get into this one specific co-op program. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to go to med school. He gone to like science uh, co-op. And he mm-hmm. was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to keep the co-op. I might just like drop it. And I told him, you shouldn't do that because you need the internship hours. And right. if I had like known that how powerful co-op was, like I would have definitely looked at that. And on the offset that like, let's say your program doesn't have co-op, really look at attacking your internships. So mm-hmm. I was very lucky during university. Like I worked every single year and I would like apply for work study programs at my school. So that's another thing to look into. Is there like a certain department that you're really interested in? And the reason why I always champion work study is because it's run through your school. So they'll never give you more than like about 12 hours of work a week because that's mm-hmm. like what the research says. Like you can only study and work 12 hours a week and yeah. they're paying you for it and like they're going to understand if you have exams so if you need to like take a week off they'll be like oh yes because you know Mm -hmm. they're the school Mm -hmm. and there's so many departments in the school that like need uh servicing so like even marketing has has like uh work study students as well so something to look into Mm -hmm. um and when I say that you should like look into internships, like when you first kind of start out in marketing, especially in fashion, you're probably going to encounter a lot of like grit work internships. So like social media where they'll be like, okay, you're going to like post 24 seven. And like the reason also why it's like that is because social media is moving so fast that it's just, it's impossible to keep up. And that's why these, these big companies have to hire younger people because the truth is like, I don't even really know how TikTok works, but I'm sure somebody who's like five years younger than me, they're probably a TikTok expert. So they'll kind of like capitalize on that. I definitely say like, never say no to things and always be really hungry, hungry in your first like Mm -hmm. internships, because uh, that's how I was able to work at Wedlux continuously because all the other interns before, they didn't have a lot of design background, but I was like, hey, yes, I know how to use Photoshop and I know how to use InDesign. So mm-hmm. that's why they kept me because I was able to like service that need and help them. And the more that you do, like you have to remember internships are also about learning. So like you also, okay, you'll also kind of benefit without having to have like the responsibility. So if you make like a mistake, people are just going to look at you and be like, it's okay, you're the intern. The inter- so yeah. you can kind of like get away with it. So someone once told me that like, you're young now and now is the time to make mistakes. So like you take the bigger risk because you don't have a lot of like things to fall back on. Mm-hmm. So when you take that risk, it's it's a big risk for you, but in the long run, it's like, it's more beneficial because you get like that learning opportunity for yourself. And um, I would definitely say like, when you're going like, don't forget to network a lot. So like networking is so scary, trust me. Like when you're coming out of like university or you're in university, Mm -hmm. it's really, really hard to go up to someone and be like, hi, I'm Tiffany and I'm like a student because you think that people don't care. But honestly, like these companies really appreciate when like they have somebody who has confidence Mm -hmm. and coming because that's the person they want to give the jobs and the internships to. I would definitely also say like tailor your resume a lot to the industry. So like, if you're going into fashion, like I was just looking at uh, somebody's resume recently for a friend and she was applying for a graphic design job, but her resume was completely not correct for this industry. She has a lot of like uh, brand and mastership kind of like event stuff. Okay. So her resume was like three pages long and it had like a bunch of stuff that nobody cares about. And I had to like, she was not happy with the way I cut it down, <laughs> but I had to be like, look, if you're going to apply for a graphic design internship, you need to be making this an InDesign. Like you need to be branding itself, like use your brand Mm -hmm. colors that are for you, like use the fonts that represent you. And let's say, I know somebody who she applied for like, it was like all over LinkedIn. She applied for Spotify and her resume, she made it look like a Spotify playlist. Oh, I think I think I saw that one. Yeah, Yeah. it was really cool. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that you can do and like, but also like keep in mind, there's two types of resumes, right? There's like the one that's just informational, like on a word doc because Mm -hmm. if you're applying for a really big company they use like like a a program to crawl your resume so if you like put in something that's like super designed it's really hard for them to read it but if you're applying for like a smaller company then definitely I would say design it out because then they'll be more impressed with what you're putting Mm -hmm. and yeah like 
a lot of companies are based on like those kind of internships like th- that they're going to hire out. So definitely like, don't be afraid and attack them. And if you ever like are not sure about something, like just really widen out your network and see if other people maybe know other people that work in that company and they can like mm-hmm. do introductions for you as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all really good tips. And I think that especially the thing with the resume is like, you're getting an opportunity right then and there to show them like your skills in terms of branding. So why not do that? all like why not do that on your resume in terms of your graphic design like um you're kind of missing an, an opportunity if you don't yeah, do that exactly mm-hmm. like don't put it like a plain word doc in if you're like going to be a graphic designer because like they're not going to hire you yeah for sure and then also I think your point about um getting like the work uh works work what was it called work, work study? study yeah work study placement is really smart too because if you um, were to just find and find a job like outside of school and not through school, your hours as a student are going to be insane. So, insane. yeah. So if you are able to find like a paid internship or a paid work placement, um, that works like uh, along with your school hours, I think that that would be such a good opportunity to take advantage of for any students out there. <laughs> oh, I would also add that, like, uh, just know, know your rights as well as, mm-hmm. a st- as someone who's working at coming out. So in Ontario, at least, um, it's like unpaid internships are not legal unless right. they're for like student, like class credit or um, it's job shadowing. So job shadowing is actually defined as like, if I were to come and like shadow you at your podcast, mm-hmm. I can't touch anything. Like I can only watch you do it. And like anything that, if you ask me to like create something or like to help you edit something that actually counts as real work. So just like, keep in mind that because there are so many companies, like even when I was first applying out, there are big companies, like multi-million dollar companies that are paying unpaid internships. And I think like, yes, when you first kind of start out, I know some people who like, they'll bite the bullet. Like I had applied to a company that now they pay their interns, but Mm -hmm. they wanted me to come in like four days a week. And they wanted me to work like 11 to 7 PM. And I had to be like in their office. And it was like an unpaid social media internship for like four months. And I basically just had to like say, no, I I can't take that. Like, first of all, that's not legal. Second of all, that's like a lot of free work that you're asking somebody to do for you so I think that also kind of tells you like what kind of company they are and I think like as you start like kind of advancing in your career like really know what you're worth um I think Natalie we talked about this before uh that like later on as you go make sure that you know how much you're worth because Mm -hmm. your power is actually like when you go into a company for negotiating for your pay it's not actually staying in a company it's actually harder for you to like make more in the long run if you stay at a company for a long time. But like, if you go to another company, you could like go bang. I'm going to start this yeah. X amount higher. Yeah, for sure. That's such a good point. Also a really good point about the shadowing. I had no idea about that. Like I, <laughs> I knew that in Ontario, it was like to do an unpaid internship, you had to have like school credit or be mm-hmm. getting internship hours, but I had no idea about the shadowing thing. So I think that's a really important thing for people to know. And also just um, like, to that as well just make sure that people are properly reading through their contracts that they're signing I think oh, as yeah. like young people or or people who are new to um you know just stepping into their career like the contracts can seem like an overwhelming thing but you really want to make sure you're you're reading all the fine print make sure yeah. that you're yeah I remember um actually in one of our first classes at Ryerson they um they had brought in a panel and it was essentially like a career tips career advice panel and one of the um one of the guests basically said that she um she had signed a non-compete which basically um made it so that she was really really stuck after leaving her position where she had signed that contract um it made it really difficult to find another similar yeah. job in her in her area because she had signed this non non-compete so yeah really make sure that you go through all of the fine print and and know your as you said like know your rights yeah, know your know, rights. Mm-hmm. it's it's really scary um signing in a contract I do have to say like I've like encountered different contracts like that like I turned down this position actually because after um Wedlux I got offered this job to like basically help this woman start a magazine and she wanted to do this prom magazine and 
I had like very quickly realized that like she had no idea what she was doing. Like she was mm. just like a big idea person, but she that's why she wanted me. Like she f- saw my application. She was like, oh my God, like this, I'm modeling my magazine after this magazine mm-hmm. we work for. And uh, I had asked, I didn't even ask for a lot of money, but she was offering me minimum wage for full-time position. And she wanted to me to sign a non-compete that I wouldn't be able to work on any like prob magazines in the next 10 years. And I was like, okay, well, like I get what she was saying. She was saying like how Canada doesn't have prob magazines. I'm like, okay, but what if I go to like work in the States and like, you know, 17 magazine, they do a huge prom edition. So you're telling me that I can't work for 10 years and you're only going to pay me like minimum wage. Like if you're paying me like a million dollars, like, okay, sure. I'll sign it on the feet, (laughs) but you have to be like really careful and don't let like HR people bully you into signing it right away. Cause they'll do that. Mm -hmm. They'll be like, Oh, like why haven't you signed the contract? And you just have to like, let them know. I'm like, Hey, I'm still interested. I just need to read through everything. And that also includes your benefits. So make sure you look at your health benefits too, because like really basic plans, like, you know, like if it's not really good for you either, like depending on your situation, like take a look at that and also look at your vacation. So there are companies like uh, that, like legally, they don't even have to give you vacation in the first year. So you have to like, kind of look at that. You're like, Hey, am I like willing to do that? Is this like my dream job that, okay, fine. Like I can Mm -hmm. all like take a vacation in a year and take a look at their sick days. I think, especially right now with COVID, a lot of companies are kind of like being scrutinized now for like the way that they're running because like um, people want to work from home now forever. And it's like, if you can work from home, then why aren't we? Or, you know, like there's people who are still operating and they're not non-essential and they're still making them go in. So like, I think definitely like, even though you really, really want a job coming out, you also have Mm -hmm. to make sure that it's good for you and like really follow your gut because if something doesn't feel right, it's never going to feel right even when you're there. That's such good advice. And also like, like you said, um, like in, depending on the company, you might be feel, be feeling pressured to sign a contract sooner or like just get a move on with things when you're first getting started with a company, but just know like what your boundaries, know what it is that you're looking for and put that ahead of anything else and put that ahead of being, feeling pressured or anything like that too, I think is really important. So Kind of to that point as well, is there, are there any mistakes that you found that you made um, when you were first getting started or anything that you would just say in general, just kind of avoid? Yeah, there are definitely a lot of mistakes and things that I wish I had known to look out for when I was first applying for jobs or starting my career. So I think these will be very helpful to your listeners. Uh, when I first started, I think I was very, very eager to join a lot of startup companies because there's a lot of growth potential there. They are brand new. They really need the grunt work and it's easier to kind of get in at that point and they'll be a little bit more willing to teach you and help you out as long as you're really looking at startup companies with somebody who's good at the helm. So if you're looking for a company that has no idea about, for example, for marketing, and you really want to learn about marketing, then it'll be really difficult for you to learn from them because you're starting at base zero. You are only like experiences. Maybe it's your, it's an education and you've just gone to marketing classes. You have your bachelor's, but you haven't really applied the marketing. It's very different applying it into the real world. Even if you're like, let's say you're part of a marketing, marketing team on a school club, it's very different applying that to a real world situation. So I wouldn't recommend you going into companies like that if you don't have somebody who like, let's say they have 15 years of experience in in like an agency and they've decided that they are going to start off on their new venture and they're actually able to teach you in that regard. Um, I think that a lot of these startup agencies or startup companies, they can be great, but you also have to look at like, again, who's at the helm because if you're looking at someone who isn't actually there 24 seven, or they're not as committed as you, you also have to ask yourself, are you willing to put in all those hours to achieve somebody else's dream? I think that's kind of what I've learned as I've gotten older, that a lot of companies that we go to or we work for, you are working really hard and uh, putting in a lot of effort into achieving someone else's dream, but don't forget about your own dreams as well. And so that I also say, when you first start out, um, This was actually really good advice that was given to me by someone who started her own styling company. And she came into our class and she was telling us how she's made it very clear to her clients that 
after five, like her phone is off. That's personal time. And that's the time she spends with her family. And one of my classmates had said, oh, well, like, thank you for sharing that information because a lot of people don't understand work-life balance. And the one thing she said to us was, no, I've earned work-life balance. When you first start out, you better be saying yes to everything because you need to be showing that you're willing to learn. And that's how you build the connections in your career, which I do agree with it to an extent. Um, I've known people who just start out in their career, they're on internships and they kind of put in the bare minimum hours versus there's people who put in like over extra time and they work really, really hard at their internships. But at the end, they all kind of end up in the same place. So I think you have to do what's good for you. Um, of course, still say yes, be respectful to the people you work for, especially if you're starting out. Um, well, no, not especially when you're first starting out, you should always be respectful to the people you work for and the people you work with. But if you decide that in the long run, what you want out of your life is this work-life balance that is defined a certain way. So when I define work-life balance for me, I'm off the clock when I'm off the clock. Um, if I have like a conversation pre that's like, hey, like we might need you to work on the weekend for a certain thing, then we'll see maybe I can make up the hours elsewhere and maybe I'll take a day off on a Monday if I have to work on a weekend. I think it's all about balance and like having a really honest conversation with the people that you work for. So of course, you know, if a company can have you working all this extra hours, then, you know, that's perfect for them, but it might not always work out with you and everybody's situation is different. So you might have different responsibilities than other people. And I think that's just something to keep in mind. In terms of major mistakes, I would kind of to the tune of what I was previously saying. Uh, when I first started, I said yes to everything, which is really good when you first start. But it kind of became this uh, ongoing trope that, oh, well, Tiffany will handle this or Tiffany will do this. And I ended up doing a lot of like other people's work, even though like it should have been shared or I was taking on a lot of things that people who were coming in should have been learning. But because I was the one who would always say yes to everything, I kind of ended up taking a lot of my coworkers' jobs and uh, taking a lot of like the effort that they put in. And it just kind of became, you know, a little bit convoluted there. So I would definitely say, make sure that you really hold down to your boundaries on that and just kind of stick to your guns a little bit. And if it becomes the fact that you're starting to do more work from other people, just have like an adjustment conversation. So I've heard advice where someone said, you can just speak to it about being an adjustment and you can also just always mention hey like that's not necessarily in my job description while I'm more than willing to like be a team player and help out it's not fair if I'm continuously doing this and again it's not about you know being lazy or anything it's just kind of knowing your boundaries and knowing exactly what you're being paid to do so if you're doing extra work you're not really getting paid for that and if you feel like that's not really fair then you should always not be afraid to speak up and I always look at it as if your company is not willing to take you seriously or your supervisor then maybe this is not the place that you want to be uh, sometimes the job is really perfect on paper but the company maybe isn't so you just have to be really careful about that and make sure that they pass the vibe test is what I say so I've uh, had experiences too, where I've gone into interviews and the job was perfect on paper, but the company, like the people that I was interviewing for, I just didn't feel that they passed good vibes for me. And if you're very, someone like me, I'm like very intuitive. And if I don't feel like this is a good fit, then I sometimes you just have to walk away. But I mean, everybody's situation is different. Maybe you really need the money versus you really need to have a job right now, right? So you have to look at your situation and kind of reassess from there. Yeah, for sure. And just have that confidence or have enough confidence in your skill set and what you bring to the table to yeah, yeah to stick to your to your guns and have those boundaries and not um, let anyone push past them because people will, if you let them. Yeah. Um, and especially if you're, if you're letting them from the start, it's like that you're setting kind of, the precedent. That, exactly. That's going to happen. Exactly. So that's really, really, um, yeah, a really smart point and really important, I think. Um, okay. So we are kind of coming to the end of the questions here. Um, it's been so great kind of learning more about what you do in terms of brand management. Cause I knew like a lot about what you did in terms of your brand and content creation. So it's been really interesting learning more about that. Um, but I would love to know kind of what you have in the works in terms of like new projects, um, and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually starting to like expand out to do more of my product photography, mm -hmm. but I'm also starting to do some like branding consultations. 
So what that would be is like a little bit more of the beginnings of the branding. So if you are like starting a new brand or you're kind of like stuck, you're not really sure, I would basically do like a presentation for you and do like a brand audit. And Mm -hmm. depending on like um, how extensive that you would require, I could also come up with like three options for different marketing and branding directions for you. So you could like choose from them. And in terms of product photography, I've already kind of like started building that out a lot more. I'm finding that I really like love creating like interesting content around that, like different reels, videos. And yeah, I'm just building those two out right now and um, starting to like get back into freelancing for copywriting Mm -hmm. as well. So the creative side of um, marketing, I do have to say though, like if you kind of like look at um, the reason why I'm not doing it like a full time Mm -hmm. is when you're asking yourself like what you want to do in your career, um, keep in mind, like for creatives, it's actually, you actually will like usually make less money on the creative side. So, uh, Mm -hmm. brand management has a little bit more longevity because that's why I was mentioning like analytical skills. So right now in the industry is like a lot of people are looking for people who can do like Facebook ads and like Google analytics because like data is like where the money's at. So that's why brand management is kind of like a mix of both, but, um, social media creatives, like what I mentioned before, there was a big boom a few years ago, but Mm -hmm. now everybody's like a dime a dozen and they can pay interns to do that. Same thing with content creation. So unless you're like with an agency or you're like a single kind of business yourself, it's like, it's actually quite hard to get like into that. So just keep that in mind as well. Oh, okay. Okay. That's yeah. Good point. So really beef up those analytics skills and (laughs) marketing skills. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. I'm really excited to see like what kind of, um, work you do with consulting and with, um, freelancing. Mm -hmm. Um, so just as my last question here, um, how can people reach out, reach out to you, um, to connect with you or to work with you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can always follow me on Instagram at the picky princess. Uh, You can send me a DM. You can take a look at all the content I'm working on there as well. Um, I would also say you can always email me at thepickyprincess.to at gmail.com. So that's .to for Toronto. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm pretty good at answering those emails and uh, answering those DMs. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany. It's always so great to talk to you per usual. Um, Thanks for having me. (laughs) Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning into the Fashion Ambition Podcast. If you liked this episode, make sure to leave a review. And if you got any great takeaways, I would love to hear your feedback. If you want to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram at Nomad and Mode and follow the podcast page at the Fashion Ambition to be updated whenever there's a new episode. I know that I always learn so much from each of the guests on the podcast, and I would love to know what stood out most to you. So feel free to tag me on Instagram with a screenshot of this episode and let me know what you learned. Thanks again and see you in the next episode of The Fashion Ambition.